Damn, son, where'd you find this? What are those? <laughs> Question for you. What are those? Trucks. It's too much style. It's the red soul. <laughs> Authenticity. <laughs> Authenticity. <laughs> Authenticity. <laughs> You know that girl who you got the Starbucks of? You know she put a smiley face on your Starbucks cup? Yeah. <laughs> Why are you surprised? You gotta go like me and get a fully brewed Persian tea. So I've been listening to Andrew Huberman about sleep cycles. Yeah, yeah he's, he's actually really good. Decaf. He's really good. The decaf. Should we talk about the elephant in the room? Your big head. Well, I think that's an understatement. Good morning, good afternoon, good morrow. Good eve. Good eve. How do you do? <laughs> How you do? Should we talk about the elephant in the room? The statement piece. The greatest king of all time. We're in the new digs. There was nothing on the wall. And we said we need something for the wall for the recording. You're a bit more conservative. You were thinking of, let's get a nice piece of art and some patterns or whatever the hell. I, I'm, you know, clearly, I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and I said, no, we need a statement piece. And so here we have on the wall, Cyrus the Great, the great Persian king, and uh, Kurosh Kabir. Kurosh Kabir. And the reason people need, before we get into the usual topics, need a f few seconds education on this is because <laughs> beyond the, here we go again, <laughs> beyond the fact that, very long story I won't go into, I had to change my traditional Persian king name <laughs> to anglicize it in order to break into the corporate world years ago. But even then, when I kept an anglicized version of a Persian name, which is Cyrus, we won't go into it. But no, 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 wait, I want to tell the story. It's brilliant. Because literally, I think it was, you were on the phone. I've, I've heard this, not direct, I wasn't there, but I've heard it directly from a mutual friend of ours, Mr. Carpet. And uh, he says you were on the phone and you were complaining to someone. Or no, you weren't complaining, but you're always complaining to customer service. Actually, <laughs> side note, if you ever need someone to test your customer services, get him to fucking call them because he'll drive them insane. Chucks. But um, aside from that, apparently you were on the phone and someone, you said, my name is Cyrus. And someone said, how do you spell that? Then you went down a rabbit hole of history. This is what I was going to say. Every fucking place I call, this is why people, the get... The viewers, listeners need a bit of education because customer service, or, or I call anywhere, like, yep, can I just take your name, please? Cyrus. Uh, 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 how, how do you spell that, <laughs> sir? Cyrus? It's like Miley Cyrus, except that will be a huge, huge insult. Disrespect. Uh, 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 okay, um, so anyway, the next security question, uh, no, we're not done there, we're still on the name. <laughs> The human rights that you enjoy so much. Oh my god, here we go. Do you want me to ruin that for you? Tell me. Well, I, 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 I've seen it. <laughs> We're not going to discuss that. But anyway, Cyrus the Great Persian King, creator of human rights, freed 40,000 Jews from Babylon. He's actually um, a Jewish prophet, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, he conquered every pretty much part of the dense part of the world at the time. The Romans bowed down to him. The Greeks bowed down to him. Until, of, of course, later he was defeated partially, but... We won't go into that, <laughs> but anyway. But even Alexander the Great talks about how he wants to emulate his empire, which is really interesting. Yes. But anyway, I just thought it's a nice piece of art, to be honest. It's a Iranian uh, content creation. It's an Iranian <laughs> artist somewhere. Authenticity. Selling it somewhere on the World Wide Web. Uh, and so I thought let's support a uh, fellow. There's, there's, wait, 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 I just want to troll you a little bit. There's this post on LinkedIn, you were telling me about it. I saw it today as well. Loads of people liked it. Rex Woodbury, I think you said it was, from Index Ventures. Yes. And he'd like done a breakdown of what all of the like, the top 10 buzzwords in tech right now. Web3, NFT, a bunch of other stuff. Creator economy. DAO, DAOs, community, all of this stuff, right? And I think in the last five minutes, you've probably used, what? 20, probably 20 of those words. Chucks. <laughs> And the funny thing is, he said, I think he said the second or third one was authenticity. It was. And I thought, ha, 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 oh, shit. For an industry that talks so much about it, isn't it interesting that it's lacking authenticity? I think the only industry is lacking authenticity more than tech right now is just traditional finance and law and all the bullshit. But tech is a lot of bullshit. We're seeing a lot of podcasts in tech pop up where <laughs> they're just... <laughs> Too, it's very tense. I'm it's not very, involved. You're not involved. I'm involved. As the great Curtis Jackson says, uh, if we cent for if, those of you who don't know, if we can't be friends, then we're enemies. There's no in the middle. 
shots fired. Yeah. People talk about authenticity a lot because tech is lacking it. I listen to a lot of podcasts people share with me. Oh, have you seen these guys doing pods now? These guys doing pods now. Some, don't get me wrong, some are very good, but a lot of them, people in tech, they're, they're just not real. Let's, let's put it bluntly. I, I don't know if they're not real. They're, there's a lot of the EQ. They're either EQ or they're trying to protect a, an image. Snoop Dogg was on Joe Rogan's podcast recently. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it opened with something like how he succeeded and just because he just enjoys himself. He is just himself. He said, what, what better job in the world than being you? But in tech, almost everyone I come across with, everyone we come across with, everyone with, like we deal with or whatever, very, very, very few are actually themselves. So it is what I, it is. I, I, it's a couple of things. I think one is that, yes, they are, there's a lot of um, a lack of authenticity because people have to, you know, techs become more corporate and people have to give a certain persona. For example, if you're a GP, you've obviously got LPs that you can't piss off. If you're, you know, someone who's got an online presence and that's what you've built your following around and that's where you've got your funding from, etc. There's a lot of people being, you know, unable to be authentic. But interestingly, as techs become more and more corporate, you see a lot less of that authentic nature of people. And actually, quite ironically, the whole hipster movement was born out of Silicon Valley and the tech guys, and then it spread to New York, etc. And so at some level, there was always authenticity in this space because you had to be a little bit contrary and different to be in tech. But right now, it just seems like it's kind of gone down the toilet. Having said that, there are cool new guys emerging, not necessarily podcasters, but like YouTubers who do cool things on YouTube for them for them for themselves, really. And because there's not anyone else there and they don't have to like answer to anyone, they're quite cool and they're quite authentic and you can see they're being themselves. So I respect those guys. When I was in corporate towards the end, and the reason we're talking about all this authenticity stuff because Rex Woodbury touched on it and James Lowe we threw up this post from LinkedIn. James Lowe, the Mana CEO, said my time at Web Summit reminded me of two things. The first one, when it comes to investors, authenticity greater than sign, name recognition every time. I lost count of the number of high name recognition, low integrity investors who treated every approaching startup like dirt. Understandably, these VCs felt like celebrities while being hogged by every startup on the planet, but they lost any semblance of curiosity in what these startups did and what their unique insights were, and it goes on and on. And his second point was, we all need more serendipity, which I agree. There's one bit that you should say. It says, instead, they were cheering drinks with old mates basking in their fleeting moments of glory while dishing out condescending dismissals. <laughs> Fucking hell. <laughs> so this is why we wanted to open, I guess, with this authenticity point. Um, when I was in corporate towards the end, I was leaving. And every year in corporate, they did these, uh, for anyone listening new, my background is unfortunately in traditional finance and banking. but. They did this annual survey, which is supposedly anonymous, but I don't give a shit, where they say you rank one to five how you feel about everything, about the company and your performance and all of this shit. And one of the questions was, at work, I feel that I can uh, be my authentic self or some bullshit like that. And it was one strongly disagree, three in the middle, five strongly agree. Uh, and I obviously put one, strongly disagree, because in corporate I had to completely change who I was and be a fucking bitch. No surprise. In order to fit in. I'm not into rugby, I'm not into cricket, I don't like to drink pints after work. I don't like- You do like Savile Row suits though. I do like Savile Row suits, which funnily enough, no one really wore in banking. <laughs> yeah. I like philosophy, science, a lot of just, all of the tech nerdy shit that we like and discuss on this pod. I basically had to hide and suppress all of that. Or like when I was leaving uh, banking to go into the blockchain industry, I got mocked by quite a few people. So my point is you can't really, it's a very, it's just turn up to work, slave away, go drink a few pints and repeat and repeat and repeat. And I was like, I strongly disagree. I'm like, since this pod, we've had a ton of people reach out to us. We've made some great friendships over the past year because people love it that we're just ourselves. And I just genuinely don't give a shit what anyone thinks, I guess. I'm uncancelable because we're not huge and this is how I like it. I like the Kevin Kelly model of 1000 true fans, which is a great aim. But my point is back in corporate, I put this strongly disagree. They had a all hands meeting or whatever shit they call it. And they said, uh, a very senior guy got up and said, 
Well, in this recent survey, um, we've seen that one of you uh, has said that you strongly disagree. And uh, and obviously everyone knew it was me. And it's like, okay. And then someone else, like a goody two-shoes uh, female got up and said, Oh, well, uh, uh, I, I think I can totally be myself. It's not like if I'm going out clubbing on the weekend, I'm going to be like that at work. I was like, you fucking idiot. You don't get the points. You don't you like just... So anyway, authenticity is very rare. If you fuck with rational, you fuck with authenticity, trucks. That is true. <laughs> if you fuck with rational, you fuck with authenticity. Basically, just good luck trying to cancel us. You can't cancel us. Yeah. And, and the what? Sorry, one last thing is uh, a great tweet a few weeks ago by uh, Delian at Founders Fund, his younger brother, actually. Mate, I, I, I just seen a few people like his tweet and I had to follow him because he talks about things like weightlifting and self-awareness and tech. I was like, great. Um, yeah, he's based. That he, kid is based. He's based. And one of his tweets was something around he thanks himself for speaking his mind on Twitter and putting out authentic tweets because he's already cancelled himself from being able to get a job at like very large corporations. Skin in the game. <laughs> he's, he's, he's unwittingly given himself skin in the game. Um, but the interesting thing is from um, James Lowe's post, he, at the end of his <clears throat> post he says, um, to your point, once upon a time, I too experienced the glory of being the soft banker and McKinseyite. He's ex SoftBank, ex McKinsey. Endlessly pursued for your genius. It only takes five minutes away from those name tags to realize it has nothing to do with you, only the power and money your employer wields. <clears throat> Essentially, this goes back to the point we raised at the beginning, which is if you have, if you are being puppeteered, if you are a Pinocchio and you have strings on you and people are puppeting you, at the end of the day, you will never be able to be fully authentic. And you you use these different um, titles, these different positions to validate that position that you yep. supposedly hold within society and to show that you are providing value and you have purpose in society. There was a tweet by um, there was a tweet by someone that I replied to and they were like, what's the most important thing that humanity, a metric that humanity... Reuben Harris. It was Reuben Harris, yes. Yeah, our our fellow... fellow deadlifter yeah yeah well, you added him on a deadlift thing. We'll, we'll put that we'll, we'll put pull that up my up. deadlift shortly but go on so um, speed it up he posted saying what is a good metric to hold um, humanity accountable by or to measure success as a human and I put sorry it was a great tweet we'll put it up we'll put it up put, if you're watching on video we'll put it up but maybe you can recall it for the listeners I put up purpose and the reason I put up purpose was because it purpose drives everything else. It drives happiness. It drives your authentic nature because if you are driven and you have the right purpose, you will therefore be driven and you will have authenticity in what you're driving towards. Anyway, point is you then don't have to like go to, you know, Harvard. You don't have to go to McKinsey. You don't have to work at SoftBank or insert big name here to actually be valuable in society. What you create yourself provides value to society and therefore gives you purpose and therefore makes you happy. I just think that if people... We, we've gone down a rabbit hole, but if people can be at some level more real to themselves and authentic to themselves, all of this bullshit goes away. And at the end of the day, that's what everybody wants. Everyone wants to be happy. I remember once in, and just to wrap up on this topic, in corporate, I was, we were out on like a team lunch and I used a London slang term having grown up in North London. And so I, I used just, just a slang term. We were making a joke with another guy who grew up in London and he understood these things. And a senior member of the team kind of was shocked to hear this stuff. It was like, what does that mean? And why do you talk like that? And uh, shut the fuck up, <laughs> shut the fuck up. So you made, you made a very valid point. It is, purpose is very important. As soon as I left traditional corporate and I said to you, I went into startups, there, there was this initial, fa obviously there's a honeymoon phase and after that it levels out, which is even after leveling out, still great. But there was this initial honeymoon phase. For the first time in my life, I genuinely looked forward to getting up in the morning. Yeah, I remember but you saying this. But alarm would ring and I'd throw myself out of bed. Do you know what's funny? You went... I know it's funny. Do you know what's funny? <laughs> there was this uh, uh, period that you went through. And in fact, you actually cut... You didn't cut yourself off, but you went into a deep, uh, deep work sort of rabbit hole of setting up your business. Cal Newport Deep Work Times Solitude Marcus Aurelius Flex. But, but it literally was that because we didn't hear from you for a good like you I came off all what, platforms, all platforms yeah. everything. You were off everything trenches. for a while. You properly went into the trenches as Chamath says and but the, the ironic thing is you were probably working 10 times harder than you were in banking with 10 times less con uh, context switching um, but you were enjoying what you were doing and you wanted to get up in the morning and do it. So authentic. I know, authentic I know this is like a big bitch, epi bitching episode about corporate but just a final. Oh, <laughs> fuck's sake. 
I remember Let it out. there was this one time where like, this is this, this is, isn't a podcast. This is therapy for my <laughs> friend here. This is for all the kids who fucking reach out to us for uh, advice for getting into banking, which is as my new essay going out tomorrow about angel investing. I always tell these kids first to get your sanity checked. You must be deranged. Secondly, learn to code, and thirdly read Brian DeCesare's article on know why you will not make $10 million working in finance and have your own beach in Thailand. Plugged here, uh, an essay you should read that I've plugged many times. But lastly, there was this one time in corporate which really uh, was, was the breaking point for me, which is someone said to me, have you checked that email yet? And I said, what email? And the, the email from, uh, it was a company we were working with, a client, and I said, no. Like, Can you reply, please? I opened the inbox and the email came in two minutes ago. And so my response to that now would be the book by Cal Newport, A World Without Email, and his book, Digital Minimalism, and more importantly, his OG book, Deep Work. And I actually had this book on my desk in corporate because I would read it on the train a few times until I finished it. And I got mocked a couple of times, but there was, there was one based guy who left for tech as well. When he saw it, he was like, ah, oh, we think very much alike. This is a great book. Um, God rest that man's soul because he must be dead after <laughs> saying line to you. And uh, yeah, normally I just pick my laptop up. I would not be at my desk in corporate and I just go sit in a meeting room or very far away in a quiet place because all of this noise, all of this context switching, all of these emails coming in, you can do one thing at a time. Even now in tech, we're seeing it a lot. Sometimes yeah. like with Twitter and all of this shit, I'm pretty sure 95% or more of the people on tech Twitter, it's a facade and they're not actually getting anything done. Um, majority of them have already reached success before this social media wave, so they have time to burn. Correct. And the rest don't understand this and have no skin in the game but burn time on Twitter. But the context switching is incredibly dangerous. Dr. Andrew Huberman or this lady who went on Joe Rogan, I forgot her name, this doctor, talked about uh, how it changes just your brain, this level of constant dopamine hitting and context switching. So it's all bullshit, HKH. Yeah, it really is HKH. Um, on the on the basis that you were talking about, um, you know, kids that come to us and ask if they want to get into finance or tech or what they should do. And They're deranged. Them, they are deranged. And there's actually, um, very interestingly... Next topic. Next topic. The tweet, a tweet by Rob K. Henderson. Um, and he says... He's, he's retweeting someone else. Should we, sorry, should we just give quick context on who Rob Henderson is? Go for it. So he's been on the Modern Wisdom podcast a few times and a few other shows, but I believe he is a veteran, a US veteran, and he is a Cambridge PhD candidate at the moment. And he studied, I don't know, what, I forgot what he studies, but it's something around human nature, psychology, and so on, I believe. But yep. basically just follow him on Twitter, at Rob K. Henderson. He has a newsletter as well. Yeah. Anyway, but he's um, yeah interested in human nature as as you as you said, and he's retweeted something by Shoshana Weissman, and it's essentially I'll read out the tweet, but I'll, I'll give some context on it as well. It says, according to this table, earning a bachelor's degree in psychology at Stanford or Yale will, on average, lead to a net loss of more than three hundred thousand dollars over the course of one's <coughs> lifetime. The table is a, is essentially showing what majors. So what main degrees you study at which institutions yield what value in terms of return on investment if you were to take that um, degree as an investment, which you should. Um, and what does that ROI look like over the course of your um, young life and your sort of midlife? So how much do you earn at age 25 and then age 45? Um, really interestingly, what do you think are the highest earning majors? Well, let me not look at this actually. Highest earning major, I already know off the top of my head, the two that instantly come to mind right now are medicine and uh, computer science. And I put electrical engineering up there as well. Any, some, some forms of engineering, mm -hmm. essentially the hardcore stems. Mm -hmm. I would also put anything non-stem is bullshit. It's irrelevant to, to be honest. You can, philosophy is great, but you can study it yourself. Go get a few books. Yep. So, We've touched on this on a whole episode in one of, the, one of the early episodes last year, but yeah, go STEM or go home. So tell me, what, what is it? You're right. So Yale, at Yale, um, the highest earning after all adjustments are made is, I believe, computer and information sciences. So general computer science. 
yields a $2.5 million ROI, basically by the time you're 45, which is actually ridiculous when you think about it. Um, and this is minimum, by the way, this is like the minimum amount you'll make. This is just a normal ROI based on that degree. So the average individual that, that does that degree, which you're, you're probably not an average individual if you do that degree. But point taken, the Stanford, Stanford's highest ROI is really interesting. It's cognitive science. Um, they make a sort of almost $3 million return on investment after adjustment. I don't even know what cognitive science is, but it must be something built around what we talked about earlier, the Andrew Huberman podcast, that type of stuff, neurology, but then also the integration of that within AI and how like you integrate technology within within the sort of development of what we're learning about the brain as, mm -hmm. as we move along. So really interesting stuff. To your point, computer science again comes up really high, 2.3 million in Stanford. I don't, mechanical engineering is there as I've one of the I've pulled highest. it up now, but I think this is actually somewhat flawed. The reason you have, you have, I mean, history as middle of the table or like mm. international relations and these bullshit kind of topics. The reason these kind of things uh, make a lot of money is, well, there's a bias here is because it's Yale. You could have any degree from Ivy League or like, let's, let's talk about the UK. People study fucking classics at Oxford and go work in investment banking. So it's more about where did you study? And I think the earnings here are skewed by all the morons who go into traditional finance because traditional finance takes any degree as long as it's from a top university. Mm -hmm. Agreed, but then it also shows the differential. So it is telling the right story, which is, yes, if you compare it to other universities, it's probably not correct. But if you actually compare it within the, the um, within the university, all of the different things that you could study, it does tell a broadly correct story, which is broadly study the, the science, study engineering, the engineering, yeah. yes, study that instead of um, applied mathematics is another one of them. But um, yeah, hundred percent agree. And I think this table will change even more. It will become skewed even more as we now enter that post finance, decentralized finance period where, you know, the, the value that is attributed to working in tech will significantly <laughs> outweigh those that, in, that, that, that exist in the as, uh, as Aaron Clary says, Arsenal Consulting has written a book on degrees called Worthless, hmm. uh, about people who get worthless degrees and what to major in. This, he wrote this over 10 years ago. He's touched on this, but we're moving, as we said on a previous episode, to a proof of work model, which is don't tell me, show me. Hmm. And unfortunately, the world we're in today, or historically, it's changing now, clearly, is a lot of charlatans and cranks, really. This 95% of these Ivy League grads. Same with the UK, you have Russell Group. Most people get out of uni, really. What do they even fucking learn in uni? I know very few people who utilize the uni experience to make real contacts like future co-founders and do hardcore stems and join all the right societies like the Startup Society and go to hackathons and do all of this stuff. And people are still going into eco. The worst thing you could do, as Aaron Clary says, this is what I was saying, is get an economics degree. It's the fucking worst thing in the world. What, what, what did we both do? Well, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, at, the, at this point in time, yeah, I think it's just completely worthless. It's it, LSE, luckily, was one of those unis where I think actually there was a lot of people that were driven in terms of career ambition as opposed to, um, you know, study, which is not necessarily a good thing um, because you don't specialize necessarily. And also it's a humanities sort of, University so it is, it is the only non-STEM university which has, I think it has, it's the highest concentration of non-STEM people in the startup world who have achieved success. Yeah, that's right. But again, that's exception to every rule, so exactly. anomaly. Agreed. But on that point of what do you study when you kind of come out of uni or on that point of, you know, what looks good in terms of a good degree, there was a tweet by Sar Harry Bakhti. I think I got yeah. his name right. Uh, he does some cool tweets, this kid. And he's written about Tiger Capital. So we spoke about SoftBank earlier, mm -hmm. all big names. Tiger is another big name in the market. And they make a, you know, they, they have been Term sheet famous. Day. Yeah, literally, they've been famous for deploying capital at a rate that is completely unseen in this market and actually topples what SoftBank did five, six years ago when they raised the $100 billion uh, vision fund. But He's tweeted saying an underappreciated edge Tiger has over venture firms is that it deploys an army of Wall Street types who have cut their teeth working 100 hours a week for years. Their work ethic shines through in how and when they do due diligence. Now, he, he tweets some other things, but I wanted to take your, take your view on this because you've obviously, both of us, but you've obviously been in this space, I've been in this space doing hardcore DDs on big deals. Mm. What do you think is the value of this 
And do you think someone should, I know this will be in your new essay, but do you think someone should be doing this? Because fundamentally what he's saying is, actually there is value in going and doing a finance uh, degree and then going and working at a top investment bank because fundamentally there are people like Tiger that will hire you mm -hmm. and you'll get a shit ton of money. You'll be worked into the ground, but you'll work on the biggest deals in tech yep. and you'll do it at, at a fast pace and learn a lot. What are your thoughts on his, uh, what are your thoughts? Well, firstly, how many shops are moving like this? There's Tiger, there's Koba2, maybe a couple of others who are moving into early stage and covering all, all stages of tech. Yeah, like Sequoia's doing deploying it. Deploying term Andrews sheets every yeah. couple of days. It's a different approach. As we said previously, Doug Leone said on, on a podcast episode with the Stebbings, he said, I've been in this game for a long time, is what Doug Leone said. He said, I've seen them all come and go in the dot-com boom, the soft banks, and now these tigers. Time will tell if this strategy pays off. That's the first thing. And I've covered this in my new essay, which people should read on angel investing. But if if you're talking late stage tech investing, fine, there is due diligence involved because you're diving into Excel models, dashboards, unit economics, financial models, decks, all of that shit. But at early stage, there is nothing really to analyze beyond human nature, the, 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 their behavior, their characteristics. You're literally just betting on the team, Correct. trying to understand how are they full of shit, how real are they, their, ta their true talent. A lot of VCs now are saying it's becoming harder and harder in this crazy market to distinguish between, as Matt Clifford says, the contrarians and the cranks or the, or the realists and the cranks because there's a lot of polished people who give off the nice pictures, who, who have been to their Toastmasters, they give them nice pictures, they have a nice deck, they have a nice put, put team. Put the picture up of you at Toastmasters. We'll put up a photo of me, I'm, I'm a Toastmasters veteran <laughs> is where I, it's like riding a bike, you get good at it with, with a few reps. But uh, anyway, beyond, beyond the Toastmasters and the decks, Toastmasters is great by the way, everyone should genuinely sign up and do 10 presentations, it'll sort you out for life. Uh, what the fuck was I saying? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, sorry, teams are polished. Yes. They have all of these decks and I, I, it was a very distinguished VC, I can't remember who it was, who said, it's becoming harder and harder. These people stop bullshitting us and we're losing money. Mm. Uh, and there's very few, and the people you should actually be going for are the people who are, uh, when they're pitching you as a VC, they're, it's, it's the kid, I think Naval may have even said this. Yeah, yeah my friend Naval. And, and he was like, yeah. the, kid, the kid who's stuttering and they, they look like a mess and they're going into very deep technical topic. They're not polished. Like they probably have a higher chance that they're actually building something. So just look into those more. Don't don't brush into the site. So it's the point I was trying to get at with all this tiger stuff. Doug said, we've seen a lot of these come and go. Time will tell. If you're investing in the early stage, this model of being able to put in a high work rate is actually detrimental 100 hours a week. Because at early stage, you are paid for your judgment, your decision-making skills on yeah. being able to judge people's character. And you're a better judge of character, quoting Naval again, as he says, people who are, I don't know, word for word, but he says people take who a are, shot. take a shot. But he says people who are tired um, or they're stressed or they're overworked or they don't sleep well, this, uh, and it's common sense, yeah, it impairs their judgment and decision-making. It does. it does. And so if you're investing pre-seed, seed, or just early stage generally, this model, fuck you up, this isn't gonna work, this Tiger model. The reason it works for them, yeah, they have a whole shop going across all stages now, whatever, but late stage, yeah, you, I mean, look, my, my views, uh, Wall Street, the city, MBB, whatever, traditional finance, if you really want to do it, two to three years max stop there because after that, the returns diminish. And Correct. what do you get in those first two, three years? Yes, you get some work rate, you get some attention to detail, you get a few things. But the way the human psychology works is when you pull so much, it goes back to exactly how we started the authenticity point. It's literally like being in a prison and it depends how much of a pussy you are. Uh, if it's important for you to be your authentic self, as it is for me, when I was in corporate, it was like being in a strangled in a prison nonstop, even though I did very well, I got on with people, but when I used to come home, I used to go, ah, oh, fucking hell. There's a hilarious <laughs> story you told me that you just come. You... I got a photo, we'll throw up the photo. <laughs> yeah, the photo. The photo. <laughs> There's a photo after I'd been working on a deal for like three or four days, uh, with just, you know, four hours sleep a night or, or less. 
um, which wasn't uncommon, you know, especially as we scaled, but I'll throw it up. It was me when I got home just laying on the floor <laughs> and I'm wearing these sunglasses at night because I had such heavy bags under my eyes in, in my Brooks Brothers Wool's quarter zip jumper. Anyway. I'm done. What was I saying before this was this bullshit? What was I saying? Uh, Basically, you're saying that. You oh, just, sorry. Just do it for two, three years. Yeah. The results diminish, and and yeah. So when when you're being strangled and you're not able to be your authentic self and you overwork, when you get out of corporate, it's it kind of goes against you because there's so much for you to explore that you go crazy. You're like a kid in a candy store. So it actually go, it works against you. I think as as everything as the, uh, the the rationalists say, mental models. As the rationalists say, it's all about balance. Max two, three years. Even then, it, it, it may impair other areas of your life long term, even after getting out. I don't know. Do what works for you. Use some fucking critical thinking. It's, it's not rocket science. It's very important for people to spend time in solitude to develop more self-awareness and what they like, what they don't like. But this tiger model of working 100 hours a week, yeah, you have attention to detail. You have work rate. It works for later stage deals where there's more yeah. numbers to crunch and analysis to do. But generally, if you want to be an angel investor and pre-seed where it's more fun and exciting, no. But these people who have moved to Tiger from Bain, and apparently Tiger has Bain on retainer, it's just an extension of their job in Wall Street. It's literally the same. Except they make more money and they get carried. But the, the interesting thing is, well, well, you might get an MP as well. The interesting thing about this, and I think this is what we'll try to wrap it up with, is whether applying the Wall Street DNA, as, as um, Sarah calls it, applying the Wall Street DNA to how deals are done in venture highlights two things for me. One, it highlights that uh, you're able to deploy capital at scale at this current point in time for various reasons, including the fact we're about to enter an inflationary period, which we'll pick up on in a minute. Mm -hmm. But two, it's interesting because it shows a shift in what venture capital actually is. And I think a lot of this was driven, of course, by uh, SoftBank, you know, five, five years ago. But it's essentially providing a, a new... Uh, entry point into what funding in this space looks like because everybody wants to be involved in this funding and the way in which to make sure you make money. This goes back to our very first episode we did, which is around the dartboard analogy of venture. They have literally scaled the dartboard analogy to yeah. the maximum level possible, doing one deal a day at that rate. They need people to deploy to do those types of deals. And it doesn't matter if it's early stage, late stage, whatever. The interesting thing about them is that they come into the market with such significant diligence into things that we that even founders were surprised by. If you look at this thread by Sam Founders Lassie, have been impressed. Founders who have gone through the Tiger process have been impressed. Loads of founders <laughs> DMing uh, Sarah and he's posting them publicly saying like, look at how impressive they were, you know, they, um, how quick and thorough they move, uh, you know, they sign NDAs, they meet, meet within a couple of days, they come with product roadmaps, revenue projections, customer projections, customers and industry experts that they could talk to, um, and potential introductions. So like they are, they are doing this really, really well, but to the point around whether you enter that industry, mm -hmm. I think you're right in which you can do it in one or two years and learn a lot from them. But also I think if you have the opportunity to join a place like Tiger at the minute, I don't think it's a bad thing. I think you get access to so many people and so much value deal. It's a them. great thing, but probability, Correct. there's not many of those shops. There's not many of those shops. And in fact, you're probably better off being authentic to yourself and creating something for yourself on Twitter that is the antithesis to what these Wall Street guys want to do because they want to be under the radar and make their money. Now, if that's you, amazing. If you're happy to work 100 hours a week, amazing. If you're happy to you know, live in that office box and just bang out diligence, which it can become really boring after a few, few years of doing it, um, both of us speaking from experience, if you're into that, good, great, as long as you're authentic to what it is that you want to do. Um, facts. <laughs> yeah. Pure facts. facts. But then on, on, there's one thing I want to move this conversation on to, which is our favorite data guy, Ethan Mollick, <laughs> at Mollick. He's a professor at Wharton who I think studies um, He's great. innovation, entrepreneurship, and what he calls ephemera, the ephemer eph ephemeral human existence. So he talks about, he does this tweet that talks about being authentic in a really interesting way, which I want to pick up with you, which mm -hmm. is he says, Twitter really does have influence with venture capitalists. In fact, he references a paper. This paper shows it can help startups make up for bad networks. If your non-New York City, Boston or Silicon Valley startup has a standard deviation more influence on Twitter than average, you raise 1.5 million more dollars from VC. Basically, what he's saying is that having a Twitter following has, has statistically been proven by a standard variation 
um, that you will be able to have access to networks that will enable you to therefore raise more money. This is the, goes back to the point around authenticity because if you're building that <laughs> following on Twitter, if you're getting loads of people around you on Twitter and you're making a buzz, one, yes, you get access to more capital because LPs want to invest in your rolling fund or whatever it is that you want to set up. But two, if you're a founder, you're able to leverage that, that network in a way that enables your brand to be valuable to LPs. Your brand to be valuable to GPs that want to invest in you. So yeah, I, I, it's amazing that we're getting research out that, that proves this. But it's like if if there's any platform that you want to be authentic on, in my opinion, it's Twitter. I think this model over any model, like the Tiger model you were previously discussing, yeah, great. But it's still it's the reason they're able to deploy so much every day is because it's heaps of L, LP funding. None of it there's <laughs> no skin in the game. <laughs> Whereas if you're on, if you're building, Sri Ram Krishan actually said this, his general partner, Andreas and Horowitz, he said, I, I like to look at, because on Twitter, it has this feature of who follows you, mm. uh, of who, who do you know that follows this person? And he says he really likes this feature because it gives the person credibility. It's essentially, it's, it's human nature. It's social proof. It's like, who else fucks with this person? Who, so, but there is a big but. There is also a ton of fucking bullshit on this VC Twitter space. Yep. There's t there's too much bullshit, uh, which is why we saw success of meme accounts like VC Brags and all of these accounts. These accounts are great because they behind every joke there's truth is because they're just ripping into the, all the bullshit that VCs just say and do. And a lot of people have actually calmed down since VC Brags has popped up, which I think is great. There's an Instagram page called Praying for Exits, which is fucking hilarious as well, man. <laughs> the guy works in VC and he's, um, he's a funny guy. Ethan Mollick also tags another tweet, which is referencing this, where he talks about a paper that was written by Tomas Jan Braun and Stoltz. Anyway, the, the paper, he, he tweets it saying, Twitter is full of venture capitalists. And so it turns out that Twitter also impacts venture capital. Technologies that are hot on Twitter get higher valuations, though they are, mm -hmm. uh, they don't lead to more successful exits. Overall, the effect is small and VCs pay more attention to stronger signals, i.e. exactly to your point, there's so much fucking noise on Twitter that often it can lead to a higher valuation but your 100%. exit and when, when the work when shit comes when push comes to shove when you've got to shovel that shit <laughs> at the end of the fucking day it makes very minimal difference to the exit valuation so yep. a lot of it is noise take it with a pinch of salt go and follow the funny guys have some fun but limit your usage limit Cal your import digital minimalism <laughs> limit your usage but build a brand it's really build important a brand. that you build, build it a brand intentionally time block one hour every evening yeah not like a junkie checking it every second because it, it sucks you in, it sucks everyone in. The reason I, I really like this Ethan Mollick, uh, just everything he's touching on is, and what you said about building a brand on Twitter, is because it's essentially accountability and a form of skin in the game. Yeah. Because the more you have, you publish and you share your thoughts and ideas, the more followers you gain in the industry and well-known people in the industry, then like we, we have a few huge names that follow us on Twitter there's accountability. Your your reputation is, as Naval says, like why is Warren, why does Warren Buffett get to bail out banks? Which is facts. It's because of the accountability he's built up over so long. It compounds that reputation. Exactly. As Buffett says, it takes twenty years to build a rep and five seconds to destroy it. You're building reputation, and we've had some exceptional contacts and opportunities and things happen with us and. Just introductions. There's a lot of going back to how we started this with serendipity. The man of six was talking about. So. If you want a lot of serendipity, just build build a following. Don't get addicted to Twitter, but if you are in this space, and as Andrew Gazdecki says, 80% of a startup is pretty much the marketing. Yeah. It's not to say fucking dismiss your product. That's the worst thing you could do. Mm. But examples of what Molik is talking about, Gazdecki himself is a Twitter marketing genius or and LinkedIn, Harry LinkedIn. Hurst with Pipe or yeah. there's many examples. Or Mateo with Eight Sleep. We've had him on the podcast when we had him on the podcast, he had like four or 5,000 followers on Twitter. God knows how many he's got now. I think maybe he jumped on that Miami wave when it was hot and then like maybe 50, 60,000 plus, I'm guessing. And he, and he built his own rolling fund off the back yeah, of yeah, his yeah, Twitter. Yeah. So yeah, you use it in moderation, but be intentional about how you use it. Yeah. There is a, there is ROI out of it, but it also could be the biggest time suck and loss if you don't know how to use it effectively. To, to, to close this bit up, um, the... Guys from My First Million Pod, which is one of the biggest um, 
business pods that exists out there. Sean Puri is one of the guys, by the way, um, he posts some really good things and he's intentional and consistent with his Twitter usage. He posted something about the metaverse and why everyone who thinks about the metaverse has got it wrong. Um, and it, he was saying on the podcast that that, that tweet, although it got 25,000 likes, it got six, almost six million impressions, right? Yeah. And he had leading people in the finance market quote tweeting, quote retweeting him and saying like, uh, this is amazing. He this got is really good. Deals from it. He got he literally, and like apparently he knows that it got forwarded to Zuck as well. So like everyone sees what he did. On the back of that, he's had fucking his his network, his actual direct network has grown as a result with people in the NFL, with people in the finance industry, yeah. with like all these different people that he probably wouldn't have engaged with otherwise have started following him. So it gives you that leverage. Naval talks about this. Take a shot. Um, but it's the leverage element of it that's really good as long as you're intentional and consistent with its usage. And I'm not, you're not. We're not, we're not that intentional with it yet. But I think that comes with practice and, and applies. As our well. friend Imran Mahmoud says, we'll throw it up, uh, we are moving from centralization to a permissionless world. Correct. And going back to your leverage points. Yeah, you, you've got to be a fool to not, if not Twitter, be doing something online. A newsletter, building something, just... Having an audience is very important, which is why now you're seeing everyone and anyone in every industry starting a personal YouTube channel with their own name. Like Gary Neville in football in the UK, he has a podcast now where he just walks with ex-footballers and talks. Or like yeah, he's got just anyone sports. and everyone has, has their own platform now. Or like we've seen all the big tech guys going tripling down on, on YouTube, like Justin Can and Gary Tan, and everyone is just going ham on YouTube. And Sri Ram's got his own. Sri Ram, like... Everyone, it's, we've, we've discussed this too much, it's well, common sense. It is common sense. Let me just wrap it up by saying, when you see, and I think I've said this before, when you see someone like Gary Tan, who's made you know, 5,000 X return in an investment on Coinbase, starting a YouTube channel after he has started making money already as a venture capitalist, yep. you know where the direction of this market is going in terms of authenticity. He doesn't need to be doing it, but he is, so. Um, I think that's it. I think that's everything we wanted to talk Any about. Any other topics? No, I'm sick of you. I need to have some, uh, chicken and broccoli in the fridge right here. You guys, you can't see from the camera angle, maybe you can, but Cyrus' shirt is popping open from how big he's gotten. The hair, the, the hairy Iranian belly is popping out. So I've been on this uh, Mark Ripito training program, which is a strictly strength training and zero on aesthetics. It's a temporary thing, because obviously it's not sustainable long-term, but the whole uh, thesis is that you get stronger by eating more and following his program. And so it's destroyed me. It's like three, 4,000 calories a day or something like that. Obviously I'm eating good whole foods, nutritious, uh, but it comes with its cost. As you can see, I look like an Iranian uncle right now, but a very handsome one, I must add. But now it's probably time for Jim Wendler uh, as, as I very recently switched to 531 a BBB Big But Boring training program. Big But Boring. Uh, which is why I have some DOMS, delayed onset muscle soreness in my lower back from deadlifts and other. Uh, anyway, great workout. If you're trying to get, actually I'm not gonna advise because no one's gonna do it. But anyway. If you wanna get big, but also some aesthetic components to your strength. Do you Wendler 531 BBB. But anyway, uh, having abs is a very, uh, off topic anyway, but we're wrapping up. Having abs is a very unhealthy, This it came about this whole Naughties magazine cover bullshit. It's a very unhealthy image that they portray of this is how, what good means. Good means if, if you can fucking lift more to me in my eyes, it's the Ripito flex. So yes, I have had, I have drank the Ripito Kool-Aid a little bit. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> but he, he has his faults as well, which I acknowledge, uh, which is why I can't stay on his program forever and it's now Wendler time. And when level, you've gained the strength, now it's with that strength, let's t shed a little bit of the fat and cut a bit more into aesthetics. But I'm never into aesthetics anyway, I'm just more into straight it's more, strength. It's more health related. Like yeah. At the end of the day, you want to be somewhat, you want to have good cardiovascular health as well. So Exactly. And he, he does a mixture of strength and very high repetition, hypertrophy, <laughs> which... Uh, hypertrophy. Hypertrophy, which means uh, you do your cardio as well, in a sense. Um, but yeah, I've always been very much about the holistic the holistic health, which is drink your ginger shots and green juices uh, and go to your sauna and do your seven to 10,000 steps a day and use a standing desk and do your McGill Big 3 back exercises. Yeah, do McGill Big 3 is the best. And do all of this shit. But anyway, as the Hodge, Hodge twins say, 
All this is just advice. Do whatever the fuck you want to do. <laughs> <laughs> right, we out. Peace. Peace. Wait, rationalvc.com. Don't forget to subscribe to the essays. <laughs> Got to plug ABC. Always be closing.